Good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming. Um, we're going to start with introductions quickly. Yeah. My name. Oh. My name is Craig Sterrett, and I'm a software architect with Intel. And for some reason, our <laughs> my computer seems to be loading whatever it wants. OK. <laughs> OK, my name is Peter Meitzer from Computer Center. Um, I'm responsible for uh, the big data portfolio uh, at Computer Center in Germany. And I'm Megan Rossetti. I'm with Walmart, and I work on the OpenStack operations team. And with that, we are just going to jump right in. Maybe. OK. So we come to you from the Enterprise Workgroup. We are all part of the Enterprise Workgroup. And the reference architectures were built out of that workgroup. In fact, they um, were part of user feedback that we received. OK. Oh. Uh, <laughs> has to be technical issues. Um, so it was part of user feedback that we received in which people were looking for reference architectures to use as a guideline in order to develop different applications on OpenStack. And that's where this started from, and we're going to dive into some of what we've done with that. So the enterprise work group, just to give you a little history about our work group, um, was founded actually in Atlanta at the OpenStack Summit in Atlanta a couple of years ago. And the core purpose of the group is to identify and overcome barriers to adoption for enterprise groups. Um, we meet weekly. From that, we've built out the reference architectures. We've put together a couple of books. We're doing a third, actually, tomorrow. Um, and what we really look at is consolidating enterprise feedback on what is, what isn't working, um, what is seen as a barrier, things in which users are really looking um, for help to overcome to make their activities a bit more seamless within their organization. Um, some of the things that, that we've gone through, we've worked on user stories. So some of that is building out brand new user stories. Um, some of that is updating white papers, um, working with the product work group on um, user stories actually for deliverables within rolling upgrades and HABM as well. Okay, And then these are just some links to our reference architectures that we're going to dive into in a bit more detail. I didn't touch anything, but that's good. <laughs> It's a good hint for me. Okay, so I'm going to cover what is the workload reference architecture. So, like she said, this got spawned out of the, or that's being done by the enterprise working group. And they really got spawned from requests by the community for um, sample workloads that they could use for training material, for um, uh, guides in order to aid operators and architects for designing their own workloads. And um, I'm going to throw in our little legal disclaimer here. You know, we're, we're building these based off of our experiences, and they are not necessarily uh, representative of what our corporations run that we're working for. So. And when we designed them, we wanted to set out to make sure that they only used open source components and that they would focus on the core OpenStack components to the, the least um, additional OpenStack components that were required in order to support the relevant workload. And also that we would provide sample heat templates and or Murano packages in order so that people could uh, go back and deploy these in their own environment. And also that these were going to be living documents and that we would um, continuously review them and update them as new OpenStack projects come out and get released and become stable. And so the reference architecture documents, basically, they start off with a general overview that goes a high-level overview of the workload discussing the application layout and topology. Then it goes over a brief uh, introduction into what OpenStack components are utilized by the workload. And then it goes into a deep dive into each of the OpenStack components 
and covering things like um, configuration information, uh, pitfalls that you might run into when utilizing the or setting up the workload. And then um, it goes into a demonstration and sample code section. And in this section, we since currently we only have heat templates, it'll go through the um, YAML files and go through in detail what each YAML file does and discuss things like optional and required parameters. And then at the end, it goes through a scopes and assumptions section. And this section mostly covers um, what other projects you could utilize uh, in the workload and um, different options uh, that you might want to consider. So the current status. So currently we have two workloads that are published and so everything is uh, linked off of, um, I've forgotten what the page is called. <laughs> we'll have the reference pages linked. What's that? Yeah. And uh, so currently we have the web applications and the big data as the two ones that we've released. We have an e-commerce one that should be out in the next week or two. And then we're currently working on a media transcoding and distribution one. And then there's future plans for some, but we're also looking for input on this. Um, so far we're looking at HPC, um, some SAS option, um, a relational database, enterprise level database, um, hybrid cloud and a CI/CD option. But really, we want to point out that you know the, we're looking for input on what workloads people are interested in, and you know to try and help us prioritize what we're going to work on next. And so we actually have a URL up here if you want to go to that um, you can go and submit feedback and submit you know input of what you might be interested in seeing in your workload, or you can submit feedback to the Enterprise Working Group email list. Mm -hmm. So the web applications, this was the first workload that we worked on. And so we um, based this on a LAMP stack, um, um, largely because LAMP still seems to be come out in the user study as one of the top stacks that's being run on OpenStack. And so we wanted it to be a standard three-tier web architecture, so have a, a web layer, an application layer, and a database layer. Uh, we wanted to make sure that it included some security, so firewall, basically security groups filtering traffic at each of the layers. Um, we wanted to make sure that we included load balancers, both at the web tier layer and the application tier layer. And then also that it would uh, support on-demand scaling and have persistent storage for the database. And basically this is how it looks on the, when it sits on top of OpenStack. And so the user requests come in and they pass through a load balancer. So it's a neutron load balancing as a service. And then passes into the um, web layer, which is uh, an auto scaling group of servers with a web security group uh, assigned to it that does port filtering to allow just web-based traffic to go through. And then um, from there, it goes through a second load balancer that distributes the traffic amongst the active application nodes. Again, this layer also auto-scales and also has a security group applied to it to filter the incoming and outgoing traffic. And then from there it goes into a database layer, and this layer is static, where we have a master-slave setup, and we have database files sitting on uh, block storage. And then in addition, we have the option for uh, Swift storage to support database backups. All right, e-commerce. Switch over. Sure. So on the e-commerce side, we wrote it to describe three main layers, the web layer, the service layer, and then the database layer as well. Um, there are also three sub-layers written into this, messaging, storage, and analytics. Um, and we wrote these using open source technologies. 
just to give you an idea. Oh. The messaging layer is the API for each service. Um, storage layer, persistent storage using Cinder, analytics layer. E-commerce uses a lot of big data and there needs to be a lot of criteria for volume, variety, um, a lot of push-pull on the e-commerce side, um, both online and offline business interactions as well. And then this gives you an overview of e-commerce. It's pretty detailed. There are a lot of parts to it. Um, the customer selection really motivates um, where data is pulled, what information is loaded, um, whether it is somebody who is logged in um, either to their account or they're going through checkout or they're browsing and then they've added items to the basket. Um, all of those are going to pull from different areas on the back end. So it tends to be extremely detailed in these. Um, this workload is certainly created as a sample. And so in this, in these guidelines, um, we looked at Keystone Glance and Heat, which sit over the entire e-commerce workload. Web servers and website services are using Nova. The database applications are using Trove. The image store is using Swift. The messaging layer uses Zakar. Applications cluster, which is attached to messaging, uses Sahara. And then persistent storage is using Cinder. Peter? Ready? Thanks, Megan. OK, big data is next. Um, before I start, I want to give you an introduction why we started this uh, reference architecture. Um, we had, um, as Greg pointed out, feedback from our customers, what they need for fulfilling their projects, their requirements. And um, what we found out at our customers that there's a very strong demand here in, in, in Europe, we are operating here in Europe uh, with Computer Center, um, for uh, big data as a service. Yeah? So, and um, as you know, big data is a horizontally scaling uh, application platform and uh, that's a perfect p uh, fit for OpenStack and, and big data. That's a classical use case. That's uh, a, a great story. Mm -hmm. So, but there's an issue. As always, there's an issue. Um, there's um, uh, uh, um, some, some know-how about OpenStack in the companies and there's some, some know-how about big data in the companies. But uh, they, they do not come together. They're, they're not teaming. Uh, uh, either the one or the other is too complicated. So our motivation was to build a straightforward reference architecture that makes it easy for those experts to communicate with each other and to find a, a, a quick entry, a low-level entry into a big data use case on top of OpenStack. So that was the motivation. And of course, uh, we used our experience from, from our customer projects how to build this uh, uh, architecture. Okay. Um, of course, we built it uh, based on open source. Uh, has a lot of reasons. And one main, main reason, which is uh, often overlooked, is licensing. If you start with uh, building as a service, uh, application, licensing is an issue. So it's better to start with open source products. And we are lucky because we have um, Ubuntu. It's a proven Linux platform. And we use uh, Ubuntu 14.04. Uh, it's very common uh, in, with the uh, 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 usage in Hadoop clusters. And we have uh, Hortonworks uh, that is 100% open source. So we combine this uh, two software products into our reference architecture. Okay. Now we want to get a little bit more deeper into the architecture. Mm -hmm. I have only two slides, so I, I will <laughs> learn it. <laughs> okay. Um, first of all, this is a little bit new, I think, for most of you probably. Um, but um, uh, a Hadoop cluster is made of several nodes. But these nodes are not unique. They have several roles in the, in the Hadoop cluster. 
And uh, the first step we took was we, we, we uh, divided them into several groups. So, for example, we have edge nodes, uh, and they have a special um, workload. Um, these nodes are specially made for giving access from clients uh, or, or uh, applications into the uh, Hadoop cluster. Then we have utility nodes, um, which is not on the screen because it's not in this, uh, uh, in the, in this, in this version. Um, this, this, they can be used for anything. They can be used for Kerberos, they can be used for, uh, uh, let's say, a repository, software repository. Um, uh, if you have to keep in mind that if you want to uh, use Ubuntu or Hortonworks, you need to have the software. Either you can get it out of the internet, uh, or you have a local repository, you, so you can use, uh, for example, um, such a, a utility node as a repository. And you have the data nodes, most common, and so-called master nodes, where the central services are located on. So, and surrounded is this by networking. And um, what is a typical setup for big data for networking is that you have a central network that covers the data. So um, all the nodes of the big data cluster in, are in one network. And this network is isolated from the enterprise network. Why is it so? Because of security reasons, um, the Linux image used for a Hadoop cluster often does not match to the Linux image used in the enterprise. Um, Hadoop, well, security in Hadoop is a special thing. So um, this is one reason. The other reason is if one of the nodes fails, data starts to be replicated. And you want to keep this replication in, 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 in inside of the network of the Hadoop cluster. So um, there's one network. And of course, what you need to access the data uh, in the Hadoop cluster, you need something uh, special, that's the edge node. And when we no look at, here, here's the user, user interface, and he's accessing the, the cluster through an, an edge network, uh, and he can access the cluster here um, through this network. So we have uh, an edge network that um, shows us the, the, the connection into the enterprise IT. Then we have a data center network, a data network that covers the, the, the network uh, just for um, 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 moving the data into the cluster back and forth. And then we have another uh, uh, network called management network to do all the administrative stuff. And then we have something here. Object store, here there's an extra network because uh, what we found out is that customers start to use object storage as their data lake. So they put a lot of their data into an object storage layer. Could be anything. Um, could, be, could be Swift too, um, but um, one dominant way to access this is through S3. So um, Hadoop naturally is, is, uh, uh, um, can access the X S3 layer. So um, it, it, it is a, a, a logical way to store some data on the, onto the S3 object storage layer and access it directly from uh, the Hadoop application. So um, we put in um, an extra network that accesses such an object storage. Okay, um, to sum it up, um, we just released version one. Um, you're right, but for example, if you use Scoop, a very common service on Hadoop, Scoop has to have access to all databases you connected to directly, and then it's broken too. You have to do some compromises uh, in the end. 
So uh, it's, it's Hadoop, it's distributed computing, it's not perfect. Okay, um, well, we use this as a, as a blueprint for you uh, and, um, well, try it, test it, give us feedback. Uh, that's very important. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you can change it. If you think, well, this part is not valid for me or I want to have it in a different way, uh, get the heat template, have a look at it, change it. I mean, it's up to you. Okay, that's a brief overview about the big data. Correct? So we are going to jump in to wrap up. And just to certainly emphasize a point, these are guidelines. They are living documents. So through different feedback, through different release cycles, they will be continuously updated, um, which is, is going to be interesting. And that's also part of why uh, we need help without question. Um, the enterprise work group certainly wants people's feedback. We want to know Literally, what do you think of these architectures? Is this something that you want to see more of? Do you want to see more detail, less detail? Um, is it something that you want us to expand off of? Um, we went through some of the ones that we have in the pipeline. Are there others that you would prefer to see? Um, where do things stand? Do they start out as good guidelines? Um, your feedback in that worked, but I'd like to see more on the security settings. I'd like to see more on um, what if you were to use this project in it, or are there other areas that it's applicable? Um, we would love people to definitely get involved. We, the Enterprise Working Group and the Reference Architecture Working Group actually meets weekly. You can join the mailing list for the Enterprise Group, which this resides under, um, and then also the meetings as well. Um, the, we do have a code for the slides, so you can download those at any point. Um, and we do have a tiny URL for, and it is small, it's only a few questions, but we'd really like your feedback to know, is this, are we on the right track? This is what we've taken from um, users, and this is from information that we've been, been asked for, um, and it is a start and with feedback, it will get better and better each process. And then we do have the sample configs link in the middle, um, and that is for the reference architectures that are currently published, and that's also where the reference, future reference architectures will be published as well. I guess one thing to note that the heat templates, they're published in the OpenStack application catalog, yes. so if you want to download the heat templates, you'll find them all there, and they're also linked out of the uh, reference architecture documents, so. Yes, thank you, that is a good point. Um, so that is where we currently stand on reference architectures, and I'd be happy to get into any type of questions or feedback. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in really quickly. We do have a mic. If you don't, okay. Mic, right. And then okay, up. again. So the, the question is, uh, a reference architecture is really a complete part of a landscape. But sometimes you have building blocks which, you ha which, which these enterprise archi architectures consist of, but these building blocks occur in multiple of these architectures. Mm -hmm. And the example I brought, uh, I brought up is the, the classic logging infrastructure. You want to have these, these ELK stacks somewhere, somewhere installed. And this is a classical example of a building block where you make a reference architecture and show how it has to be established. But it's not a complete one in the sense that it is a complete uh, business thing. Have you already thought of something like this, or is this uh, a new thought in your, in, in your context? 
of adding in the centralized logging to what we have or doing a reference architecture doing on? doing the reference architectures more on uh, not only on this on this overall but having also building blocks that you can pick out and and combine it to new reference architectures well actually the big data reference uh, um, is kind of uh, built on that principle because this is the version one mm -hmm. um, as I told you the connection to the object store is not existing at, at this point um, what is also missing Kerberos authentication for example uh, it's, it's not in there so far but it's used in most uh, enterprise environments it's coming uh, into the architecture uh, at a later point in time with the next version uh, but we have the utility node is prepared for something like that. So you can use Kerberos on a utility node in the big data reference, but you could also use it for something else. You could use a repository, a local repository for deploying software, Ubuntu or Hortonworks, into the big data reference, but you also can use it for anything you want. Uh, this will be added for example, into that reference. And then, then you can start picking it and say, okay, I, I like it, I don't want it, I don't need it, mm -hmm. or yeah, great. Uh, it's a great idea, uh, maybe I do it some, a little bit different, but um, I think that's, that's, that's one thing you want to point out, that, that it's, it's more a module, it's more of, of building box. Do you need the mic again? <laughs> Yeah, I think it, it's it's really the point. Maybe you have to just make them first, f first, uh, first view citizens in a way that you not only have a view which which which, you, which says that it's part of a you can pick it out of the of the of the reference architecture, but you have a list and say okay maybe it's uh, described there, but it's building block you may can use somewhere else. Maybe it's an interesting task to do to to identify these things and make them yeah a little bit more. Outstanding. Fine. We'd certainly love your help on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and to even go back, so that was with big data. With e-commerce, what we find is we put together a pretty general outline. There are so many different possible moving parts of e-commerce that depending mm -hmm. on the needs of the customer, quite a bit of this can change. And it, it honestly depends on how customers are looking to deploy that. And part of the reason that these are, are considered guidelines for right now, um, but we want to get them to be more of where users are really going to them to pull out that data and that type of information. So it's excellent feedback. And that's exactly what we need is, okay, this, this is where we are. This is what we've worked on. How do we make it better? How do, how do we give it back? to the community to make it more um, easier to follow, more deployable um, to answer some of those questions. Any other questions? How does your working group interact with the upstream projects? So I heard you mention Trove and Zakar as example components within the reference architectures. Mm -hmm. um, have you worked with those teams or does the work product that the working group has produced um, provide value, you know, have you heard feedback from those teams, oh, you, your architecture had encountered this particular problem and needed a solution that's influenced a uh, development roadmap? So what we, with the enterprise, kind of how we flow some of the information upstream is we work through the product working group instead of we don't want to create an instance in which um, you're sort of overwhelming PTLs with, hey, have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? Could you review this for us? Have you looked at this? So we're trying to keep that um, kind of continuous process of taking in user feedback and creating user stories, um, especially across projects, and feeding that through the project working group to make sure that there's a consistent process into the technical community. Any other questions? All 
right, well, thank you very much for your time. And I'll bring up the tiny URL again because we would really, really like your feedback. Thank you, guys.